So let's state the domain and range. The domain is supposed to be a set. So the domain is the set of all x's. Those x's are 1 and 6. The range is a set of all y's. That's 4 and 7. Is this a function? Yes. Every time you put a 1 in, you get one choice to come out. Every time you put a 6 in, you only get one choice to come out. So it is a function. Number 2, domain, set of all x's, 7, 8, 9. 7 is mentioned twice here and here. You only have to write it once. You only should write it once. The range is a set of all y values, 0, 5, 4, and 8. Is it a function? No. It's not a function because sometimes when you put a 7 in, you get a 0 out. Sometimes when you put a 7 in, you get a 4 out. If you have a choice, it's not a function. To be a function, you should get the same answer every time you put in the same number. 3 and 4, given that x is an integer, integers are whole numbers, positive or negative, including 0. State the relation representing each of the following listing a set of ordered pairs. Your answer is a set of ordered pairs. Then state whether the relation is a function by circling yes or no. So here my domain is going to be 3 and 4. So I'm going to put 3 in. I'm going to put 4 in. So my relation is 324, 432. It is a function. Each element in the domain is paired with exactly one element in the range. So that makes it a function. Number four, my domain is negative 4, negative 3, and negative 2, and negative 1. So I got four things to put in instead of one thing like I did last time. So let's put negative 4 in. Absolute value of negative 4 is positive 4. 4 plus 7.4 is 11.4. too much room there, so I'm going to squeeze this down a little bit. Another number in my domain is negative 3. So I substitute that in using parentheses. Absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3. Positive 3 and 7.4 is 10.4. Next number in the domain is negative 2. Substitute that in. Absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. Positive 2 and 7.4 is 9.4. That's three ordered pairs. And the last one, I need to put a negative 1 in. Substitute, use parentheses. Absolute value of negative 1 is positive 1. 1 and 7.4 is 8.4. Set of ordered pairs, my relation. I have the set negative 4, 11.4, that ordered pair ordered pair of negative 3, 10.4, ordered pair of negative 2, 9.4, ordered pair of negative 1, 8.4. This is also a function. There is only one y value paired with each x value. The symbol, the greatest integer not greater than x, means the greatest integer not greater than x. If f of x is the greatest integer not greater than x plus 11, find each value. Remember, this means 
that if you're given something that's not an integer, to round it down. So substitute 5.2 in for x. Order of operations, do the grouping symbol first. These brackets are a grouping symbol. That rounds down to 5. 5 plus 11 is 16. Number six, please don't reach for your calculator. Substituting the square root of 35 in for x. Square root of 35. I know it's five point something. Five squared is 25. Six squared is 36. This is five point something. Five point something rounds down to five. As soon as you round it down, you don't use the brackets anymore. So this answer is also 16. Number seven, we got f of the difference of q and eight. So we substitute in here q minus eight in for the x. This one here is a little tricky. Eight is an integer. So that means since it's an integer and you're subtracting it from q, which may or may not be an integer, it's not going to change the decimal part. Therefore, I can take the 8 and pull it out of the brackets. The Q has to stay in. Because I don't know if it's a decimal, so I may have to round it down. A minus 8 and a plus 11 is a plus 3. That's as simple as that becomes. Next set, given this function, find each value. f of negative 2. I'm going to substitute in for x negative 2. Simplify, order of operations. Parentheses first, I got a negative 2 in parentheses, nothing to do in there. Then exponents is next. This is being squared. Squared means times itself. 4 minus a negative 7 is a negative 3. The absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3. Next we have 3.6. I'm using a calculator, regrettably. 3.6 squared is 12.96. Subtract 7 from that and you're going to get 5.76. Pardon me, 0.96. The absolute value of this number is the positive version of that number, which was the same as what it was originally. Finally, number 10. squaring 8m, and then we're subtracting 7 from it. 8m quantity squared. You square the 8 and you square the m. Gives you 64m squared. We're supposed to subtract 7 from that and then find the absolute value. Well, since we can't subtract 7 from that, because they're not like terms, we can't do anything else. That's as simple as we can make that problem. Last two on this page, find the zero of, the, of each function. That means find the x-intercepts. Find the roots. Put zero in here for f of x. Solve the equation, and you get the x-intercept is 3. This one here, zero is 11. No, it isn't. 
That doesn't make any sense. 0 can't equal 11. This has no zeros, no x-intercepts. It's a horizontal line above the x-axis. Name all values of x that are not in the domain. So we're finding excluded values. Excluded values come in two cases. One, if you have a denominator with a variable in it, and two, if you have an even root radical. So my excluded values, I take my denominator, set it equal to zero. Absolute value of 4x plus 18 equals zero. Solving this, get the absolute value by itself, and we get this. If you got this wrong, it's probably because you just simply followed the mathematical process that I gave you. But you didn't stop to think about what this means. The absolute value, the answer to that has to be positive. This over here on the right is saying that it's negative. A positive can never equal a negative. This is a false statement which means there's no solution to this, which means there are no excluded values. There are none. Nada. Hasta lasagna, you don't get any on you. That is from Mission Impossible 1. Emilio Estevez said it, I believe, right in the elevator shaft before he got waxed. Number 14, we have an even root radical. So let's find some excluded values. Take your erratic hand. at it less than zero. If it's less than zero, it's a negative. If it's a negative, a square root of a negative is imaginary, so it's excluded. x squared minus 81 is less than zero. Solving an inequality that has an exponent, it's not great. So we're going to go with the old made up pretend method. I hate to do that. It's got to be a better way, but I don't know what that is. Change this to x squared minus 81 equals 0 and solve this. Once you get your solution, then we're going to use a number line to figure out what our answer actually is. We're going to get x equals plus or minus 9, positive or negative 9. When you do the even root, you get plus or minus. I take my solutions, put them on a number line in ascending order, that means from smallest to greatest, this says y is less, or x squared minus 81 is less than. So we use the dash segment. Two solutions, put those on, smallest on the left, biggest on the right. You then pick a test point to the left, to the middle, and to the right of these numbers. To the left, I'm going to pick negative 10. Between, I'm going to pick 0. To the right, I'm going to pick 10. If I put a negative 10 in for this, this referring to the inequality where 0 is by itself. Negative 10 squared is 100. 100 minus 81, we don't really care what the number value is. We just care if it's positive or negative. That's positive. 0 squared minus 81 is negative. 10 squared minus 81, that's positive. Our answer? Well, this here says less than. So where is it less than? between negative 9 and 9. Excluded values? Between negative 9 and 9. Number 15. Excluded values. Take our denominator. Set it equal to 0. This tells us what x cannot be. Solving this, square rooting, take the even root, it's plus or minus. This simplifies to four square roots of two. I can show you real quick how that simplifies. You don't need to show this. breaks down to square root of 16 times 2. 16 is a perfect square. Its square root is 4. 2 is not, so it's 4 squared, so 2.
Use your graphing calculator to determine whether each equation is a function. This equation here, in order to put it into your calculator, into y1, you need to get y by itself. I would suggest to multiply each term by 36 to do that. y36. Well, here 36 divided by 36 cancels. Here 36 divided by 9 is 4. So that leaves us with 4x squared plus y squared equals 36. No more fraction. If we subtract 4x squared from both sides, we get y squared is 36 minus 4x squared. Square root both sides, you get plus or minus this. Since it's plus or minus, you're going to have to put this in your calculator twice. One time into y1. Another one into y2. It doesn't matter which one you put where. You find this is an oval. y-intercepts of 6 and negative 6. x-intercepts of 3 and negative 3. Is that a function? No. It doesn't pass the vertical line test. If I were to take a vertical line and run it over this, I would be hitting the graph in more than one location at certain times. So not a function. Number 17, you put this in your calculator, and it's going to look something like this. It's a function. It has a y-intercept of 0. Write each inequality that describes each graph. Write an inequality. This is a dashed segment, therefore this is going to be not equal to, just less than or greater than. If you look at shaded below that, so we're saying y is less than. Y's go up and down. If it's above, it's greater. If it's below, it's less than. Number 19, it is shaded between 8 and negative 2. Negative 2 is small, 8 is bigger, our variable is y. So negative 2 is the smallest, it's less than y, y in turn is less than 8. y is between negative 2 and 8. When you write these compound inequalities, you should always, when I say always, I'm pretty sure I mean always, be less than symbols. You can write this in a couple different ways. I would suggest getting y by itself. You don't have to do that. I'm not sure if I did that on the answer key or not. Same way we did the last one. Which one of these graphs is higher? Well, you need to figure that out. Just make a vertical line. Which one hits that vertical line higher on the vertical line? This one up here does. This is the higher one. This one is the lower one. The lower one first, put the higher one last. Notice the y-intercept is 2, this one's 10. Both have the same slope. This one's definitely higher. Put your y between, you're always going to have less than symbols. Once again, this is saying y is greater than 8x plus 2, y is less than 8x plus 10. It's between them, bigger than one, smaller than the other. Continuing to graph here, for 21, I'll get y by itself, multiply each term by 2, subtract 2 from both sides. We have a y-intercept of negative 2, and we have a slope of 2, up and to the right. X-intercept the root, the 0, put 0 in for y. You get an 
x-intercept of 1. That doesn't seem right to me for some reason. One moment. Yeah, that's right. One. There's your graph. Not drawn to scale. Number 22, x is greater than negative 3. If there's no y in it, if it's just an x and then that equals a number or less than or greater than a number, it's a vertical line. It's a vertical line at negative 3. It's dashed because it just says greater than. Since this is an x value, you read it going left to right. Is our x value is bigger going to the right or to the left? They're bigger going to the right, so it's shaded to the right. Number 23, uh, to my knowledge we have yet to do the parent graphs. I think that comes up later. So use your calculator for this. You'll find this is a v, absolute value function has a y-intercept at 6. It should be dashed. Should be dashed. It says y is greater. So it's shaded in here. Make sure you label that y-intercept. Twenty-four so we'll subtract these two functions. So f of x minus g of x. That's a negative seven over x minus nine minus in parentheses x squared plus two x. Gotta use parentheses there. Get common denominators, multiply the top and bottom of this by x minus nine. When you subtract, leave the denominator the same. Take your first numerator minus your second numerator. You can simplify this numerator quite a bit. If I distribute the x squared, x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times subtract 9 is subtract 9x squared. 2x times x is plus 2x squared. 2x minus times a minus 9 is a minus 18x. So need those brackets because of the subtract sign that's out here in front. Distributing that subtract, well before I do that let me combine these like terms here. Minus 9x squared and a plus 2x squared is a minus 7x squared. Now let's distribute that negative. We're going to have a negative x cubed plus 7x squared plus 18x and then minus 7. This minus 7 doesn't change because it did not have this negative in front of it. It's all over x minus 9. This numerator, if you try to factor it, you'll find that it doesn't. Find excluded values. We have not gotten rid of anything from our denominator, so we'll just take our current denominator and say that can't be 0, therefore x can't be 9. So our answer is f minus g of x equals negative x cubed plus 7x squared plus 18x minus 7 over x minus 9 so long as x is not 9, because that is undefined. Twenty-five division f of x divided by g of x f of x is negative seven over x minus nine g of x is x squared plus two x a fraction divided by something is the same as the fraction times the reciprocal of what you are dividing by. I'm going to do two things in this next step. Uh, they're not dependent on each other, so we can do those two things at the same time. I'm going to multiply my numerators. 
my denominators, I'm going to write them beside each other, but also factor this second binomial. You can see nothing cancels on the top and the bottom. This gives me a great opportunity to find my excluded values. x minus 9 times x plus 2 times x can't equal 0. Set each factor equal to 0. Solve them, we get x can't be 9, can't be negative 2, and it can't be 0. Excluded values. So almost finished here. f divided by g of x equals negative 7. Our denominator, if we multiply this out, let's see, we're going to get x cubed. minus 9x squared plus 2x squared minus 18x. Which of these two combine to give us f divided by g of x equals negative 7 over x cubed minus 7x squared minus 18x so long as x is not 9, negative 2, and 0. So I'm going to check real quick, make sure that's the right answer. Yep. Number 26 composition. Find f of g of x and g of f of x. f of g of x is f of g of x. Which is to say we're going to take function g, plug it in here, x squared plus 16. Then in function f, Every time that you see an x, you replace it with x squared plus 16. x squared plus 16 quantity squared is going to be x to the fourth plus 32x squared plus 256. Distribute that 13. I'm embarrassed to say I'm going to use a calculator here. 13 times 32 is 416. 13 times 256 is 3,328. G of f of x, which is g of f of x, which is g of 13x squared, which is 13x squared quantity squared plus 16, which is 169x to the fourth plus 16. We get f of g of x. That's f of g of x, which is f of 11x, 
which is 11x cubed plus 11x quantity squared, I forgot to say quantity last time, plus 1. 11 cubed using a calculator is 1331. So we got 1331x cubed plus 121x squared plus 1. f of, g, pardon me, g of f of x. That's g of f of x. Which is g of x cubed plus x squared plus 1, which is 11 times x cubed plus x squared plus 1. Which is simply 11x cubed plus 11x squared plus 11. Determine if these are inverses of each other. Do a composition, and if you get x for both compositions, then they're inverses. That's 2 times the fraction x plus 3 over 2 minus 3. Multiplying and dividing by 2, so they cancel. x plus 3 minus 3, those cancel, so you get x. So this has potential to be inverses. Then we do g of f of x, which is g of 2x minus 3, which is 2x minus 3, parentheses, plus 3 over 2. Minus 3 and your plus 3's cancel. Your 2's cancel. These are inverses. Number 29. Uh, before I get into this, I want to get rid of these parentheses. I'm going to distribute the 3 and get 3x minus 28. 3x minus 24, rather f of g of x, f of 3x minus 24, which is 1 8 times the difference of 3x and 24 plus 3. I distribute this 1 8, I'm going to get 3 eighths x minus 3 plus 3. The 3's cancel, and I get 3 eighths x. Not x. They're not inverses. Thirty. Find the inverse of the function, then determine if the inverse is a function. So to find inverses is simple. Replace f of x with y. Interchange your x and your y. Get y by itself. It's going to be simplified technically. Technically, this here is the cubed root of 1 8 times x. The cubed root of 1 8 is a half. A half times a half times a half is an eighth. If you don't do that, I'm not going to take it off because we haven't covered that yet. I know you've learned it in the past, but is this a function? Yeah. At this point, go ahead and use your calculator and you'll find that this
looks like this passes the vertical line test. 31, once again, replace f of x with y. Interchange x and y. Get y by itself. Main thing you have to be careful of here when you square root both sides. You're going to get a plus or minus. Not a function. This is plus or minus. When you put an x value in, you get two choices for y. If you get more than one choice, it cannot be a function. Thirty-two. Mike can spend up to sixty dollars per day, plus twenty plus twelve cents per mile when renting a car. Total cost of the daily rental is a function of the total miles driven. Uh, I need to define these variables. I'm going to say that x is miles driven. C of x is total cost. Write a linear inequality that expresses the acceptable daily rental car cost. I'm going to first write a linear equality in, in equation. His cost, he can spend 12 cents for every mile, plus he can spend $60 on top of that. He can spend up to $60, I'm ignoring the up to, he can spend $60 and then he gets 12 cents per mile. So let's write a linear inequality, he can spend up to, which means he can spend that or less. So this is our inequality. This is the answer to part A. Graph it. The y-intercept is 60. This y-axis is cost of daily rental. This x-axis is miles driven. The slope is 0 0.12. That means every time you go up 12, you go to the right 100. This is 12 hundredths which means you don't go up that much. Now notice I'm not going to graph anything to the left. If I graph to the left of the y-intercept, y-axis I should say, then I'm saying he drove negative miles. Even if you drive backwards, you're driving positive miles. Also, uh, he could drive no miles and spend $60 to rent the car and just listen to music. Also, when I graph under this, when I shade under it, because it's an inequality, it's less than. Don't go below the y, the x-axis. If I went below the x-axis, then that's saying negative money, which means the car rental place is, is paying him to take the car, which makes no sense.